It's time for The Verdict. The Verdict is a lively discussion of current events and legal issues pertinent to Oklahomans. The Verdict is hosted by Kent Myers and Mick Cornett. It's time for The Verdict. And good morning, I'm Kent Myers. Welcome back to this uh, verdict this Sunday morning. Uh, Mick's not here uh, today, but we'll be back next week. I want to ask you now, sitting in your uh, living room or wherever you might be, uh, ask you a little question. Who is Richard Jewell? Think about that a minute. Some of you may have an answer about that. Some of you may not. A name that was very familiar a number of years ago to most of us that follow uh, uh, news around this country. Uh, he was the security guard at the uh, Olympic Park in Atlanta who was falsely accused of uh, bombing that uh, site and uh, was subsequently cleared. Uh, part of the reason he was cleared was because the uh, uh, information about the actual bomber, Eric Rudolph, was discovered. Eric Rudolph was sought, has now been caught, has now been sentenced, and we are pleased to have today a CNN uh, uh, special uh, producer, senior producer for CNN in the investigative unit to talk to us about the Eric Rudolph case. I think you'll find it fascinating. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Verdict. I'm Kent Myers and Mick Cornett will be back with us next week. This Sunday we're very pleased to have a special guest, uh, uh, Henry Schuster, the uh, senior producer in the investigative unit for uh, CNN. Henry uh, is a graduate of Emory University and Cambridge University, has been at CNN since 1981, has won both an Emmy and a Peabody Award for his journalistic uh, activities, was embedded uh, with the troops during the Iraq War, has covered the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the Los Angeles riots, and uh, the subject that we'll talk about most today, probably the bombing in Olympic Park in Atlanta uh, a number of years ago, done by Eric Rudolph. Uh, he uh, uh, has uh, recently published a book that we're going to be talking about, and I just want to take a minute to, to show it right now. It uh, is uh, entitled Hunting Eric Rudolph, uh, published uh, and uh, written by uh, Henry and um, Charles Stone. Uh, Henry, thank you for taking time to come, with us, to come visit with us this morning. We're pleased to have you. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, Tell me about what your job is as a senior producer in CNN's investigative unit. Well, my job is to cover terrorism domestically and internationally. I've been doing both for at least a decade now. Uh, since 9-11, it's been primarily international terrorism, with the exception of writing the book on Eric Rudolph. But I'm coming back around now to covering some more domestic issues. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be here in Oklahoma City uh, at the invitation of the Memorial Institute to speak with some folks uh, there. But I'm also here covering, because there's another domestic terrorism case, who would have thought that the week after we marked the 10th anniversary of Oklahoma City, that right across the street, there's another man who faced uh, a trial. And this man, Sean Gillespie, we, we've already done a story about him on CNN. He videotaped himself bombing a synagogue, firebombing a synagogue here in Oklahoma City. Just perpetuated his own conviction, I suspect. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think this is a man who thought that he was making a training tape. Um, you know, all of the Al-Qaeda training tapes, but, you know, most of the time when the Al-Qaeda guys make these tapes, you know, they're willing to die for their beliefs. He was firebombing something, and he gets caught. He doesn't realize he hasn't erased the tape, and, uh, yeah, that's the evidence that's used to convict him. And convicted, and presumably will will receive a serious sentence. At least 35 years. Yeah. Wow. Uh, all, uh, he recorded the, I wonder and, if he, he recorded yeah. sentencing on tape as well. Gosh. <laughs> uh, what is the uh, theme of the talk that you're going to be giving, or uh, by the time this show will have aired, you have already given it to National Memorial? Well, it's about domestic terrorism. It's about Eric Rudolph and how he fits into the scheme of domestic terrorism, um, how we look at people like Tim McVeigh and Eric Rudolph, who are lone wolves, these so-called lone wolves who act on their own or with one or two other people. Um, 
and what we can learn by looking at his case. I mean, it, it, it's a fascinating case from start to finish. It's almost novelistic in all the twists and turns that it takes. But at the heart of it, you know, there's something very serious um, and dark. And you know, in Oklahoma City, of all places, it's it's a good place to talk about that and look at that. Before we uh, before we talk about his crimes specifically, talk a little bit about his uh, growing up, his family background, uh, and how that played a role in his subsequent activities. Well, this is a guy who was raised on hate, um, plainly and simply. You know, if I was a screenwriter, I could not make up Eric Rudolph's life. He has a mother who's a nun who leaves the Catholic Church, denounces it for its corruption. Then she goes on what her former daughter-in-law calls the search for the true church. She embraces extremism. She gets her hands around this notion of Christian identity, which is a theological version of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. It's um, basically, it's the Bible is it's the history of the white race as far as they're concerned, that everybody else, blacks, Jews, Asians, others, are called mud people. Um, they're the spawn of Satan and, you know, in the form of the snake and even so the Garden of Eden. Related to I mean, the Aryan Nation? Or? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Aryan yeah. Nation is, is one, of the, uh, was one of the leading organizations of, uh, that believed embraced Christian identity. And so he's exposed to this at an early age. His mom moves him, after his father dies, his mom moves him and his kids, her kids, up to North Carolina, the, the hills of western North Carolina. One of the first things that Eric does when he gets up there, he's in ninth grade, he writes a term paper about how the Holocaust never happened. Now, if you jump ahead to 1995, right before the Olympics happened, he's still believing the same thing. He's still telling that to somebody who comes to buy the family home, you know, all those years later. So this is a guy who's consistent in his hatreds, and he's been exposed to them, but he's also got this family that's just completely whacked out, if I can use the technical term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, he, what, what did uh, this uh, uh, family training and other uh, factors cause him to do? What crimes did he commit? Well, you know, we don't even have to say he's accused of because he stood up in court and admitted them. He yeah. bombed um, the Olympics, 1996. I think that's what everybody remembers, it's yes. the Centennial Park bombing. Then six months later, he bombs an abortion clinic in Atlanta. And then a month after that, a gay and lesbian nightclub. Disappears for a year, goes dark. Then a year later, an investigator still don't have any leads. He bombs an abortion clinic in Birmingham. Uh, he's spotted so improbably by a guy who hears the explosion. He's a, he's a student. He looks at his dorm room window, he hears the explosion, he sees one guy walking away while everybody's walking towards this site. And he gets in, goes downstairs, gets in his car and chases him. And he follows him through twists and turns. This guy even drives his car ahead of where he sees Rudolph so he can stop pretending he's got car trouble and, and get a good idea on him. Then he goes looking around for a um, the guy disappears into the woods. So this uh, student goes looking for a place to call, gets to a McDonald's, calls 911. As he's calling 911, he sees a guy, the same guy walking out of the woods. So he's like excited all about this. He's telling that a lawyer overhears him. The two of them then get in their cars and they follow this guy again. They see him getting into his truck. They both write down independently his license plate number. They try to follow him. They lose him. One guy breaks off to tell the, a police officer he sees. By that time, Rudolph's gotten away. Is that the first time they knew it was Rudolph they were Absolutely. looking for? Absolutely, yeah. You and know. so he had completed all his uh, uh, bombing activity before they knew who had done it. Well, right. He had intended to do more bombings. He had stolen 250 pounds, of, more than 250, 300 pounds of dynamite. So this clearly was not going to be the end of his campaign. But you, it takes him a day and a half to, to sort of try to reach where he is in North Carolina um, because he doesn't give the right address. And they're tracing, they're tracing, they're tracing. But the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So the FBI agent on the ground in North Carolina is closing in on getting an address for him. But it's the next night by this point. He pulls up into a guy's driveway. He's been given this guy's name. And finding a house in that area of North Carolina is not an easy task. I mean, you're talking about mountain hollows, you're talking about gravel roads. He pulls up to this guy's house, and he, the guy walks out and says, oh, you must be here about Eric Rudolph. The, guy, the FBI agent's jaw drops. He says, well, how did you know that? And he says, well, the U.S. attorney in Birmingham just announced it on TV, and uh, I just saw it on CNN. And the guy is like, oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> Well, Eric Rudolph hears about this. In the meantime, the FBI agent calls the local sheriff, finally calls the local sheriff, within 15 minutes has an address. The local sheriff says, hey, should we go out and, we know where it is, should we go out and get him? He says, no, wait till we get there. It's another two hours before he gets there. In the meantime, Rudolph has heard about this. He's gone, he's gone to a Burger King, had a, you know, had a Whopper and fries and a Coke. Then he's gone across the street to a grocery store, bought six months worth of groceries, and he disappears. 
They had him and lost him. They had him and they lost him, and they wouldn't find him for another five and a half years, despite $30 million plus looking for him. And people died in these bombings, did they not? People, absolutely. A woman died in uh, Atlanta. A hundred more people were injured. It's a remarkable, it's almost a miracle that a that hundred people didn't die. That bomb in Atlanta was the largest bomb that the FBI and the uh, ATF have in their records of being a pipe bomb. It's actually three pipe bombs together. Some kids, and they were what actually got the attention of the security guard, Richard Jewell, had knocked the pack over on its back because they were thinking about stealing it. If they hadn't, it was a directional bomb. If they hadn't, it would have blown straight into the crowd. And people had been pushed back, but not very far. And you would have had just horrible, horrible amount of deaths. Let me jump in here and get us to a break, but I want to come back to that when we get back. You're watching The Verdict uh, with Henry Schuster talking about the hunt for Eric Rudolph. We'll see you in just a second. And welcome back, Kent Myers, uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, Mick Cornette will be back uh, next Sunday. We're visiting with Henry Schuster, the author of Hunting for Eric Rudolph. Uh, he wrote it with uh, Charles Stone. It's an insider's account of the five-year search for the Olympic bombing suspect, a fascinating uh, work that I thought then was, uh, it gripped me like a John Grisham novel does. The difference, of course, is it wasn't John Grisham, and it's true. Uh, a very fascinating book that I'll uh, tell our viewers a little bit more about in our final segment about where they can get it. Uh, one thing that, uh, that Eric Rudolph did that you pointed out in your book that he, he uh, on a, several occasions, used a two-bomb approach. What does that tell you? That tells you, and he admitted it after, he admitted it a couple of weeks ago when he put out his little, uh, his statement about why he did things. He was going after law enforcement. He wanted to kill the people first, and then when the law enforcement first responders showed up, he wanted to kill them. And it's, that, a, it's, it's a tactic the IRA used to use. Yeah, and it shows uh, a real hatred for the government or authority it, it is above and beyond the target in the first place. Absolutely, and you know, the, the, he skipped a year between the last Atlanta bombing and the Birmingham bombing. One of the things he was learning to do was make remote control devices, and that's what he used in Birmingham. He was going to wait until the clinic opened up and there were about 15 people on the front stoop and he was going to set the bomb off there. But just a few minutes before that, a police officer spotted it. So he waited until the police officer was over examining it with his baton and then he blew it up. Wow. Yeah. The uh, uh, press, and I'm sure your, your uh, network as well, uh, reported after he escaped and was on the run that the community in North Carolina, or at least some members of the community, kind of rallied around him. Uh, we heard uh, uh, stories about a song, Run Eric Run, and about t-shirts, Run Eric Run, almost a Robin Hood type um, uh, approach by some. Uh, what did you uh, discover in relation to that? Well, I think it was, I, I think there was a, you know, as the media often does, there was a vast oversimplification. Western North Carolina is a very isolated, remote place. People up there are friendly. I've been going up there since I was a kid because there's a great places to raft up there. But a lot of law enforcement, a lot of media weren't from there and weren't for the South. And they looked at everybody like they were, you know, some hillbilly. Yeah. Uh, and that um, everybody was the enemy. Law enforcement, I mean, they came in, they almost invaded the town of Murphy and the town of Andrews. Uh, they were all in camo fatigues. They were flying helicopters over town on church, you know, Sunday morning on Wednesday night during church suppers and things. A little bit of common sense goes along, and courtesy goes a long way. Some people took it up and made it an us versus them thing. I don't think it was the majority of town folk, but nevertheless, there were people out there who sympathized with him, and they sympathized with him for a couple of reasons. Number one was this us versus them, but the other is that abortion was an issue. They, you know, until he was indicted in Atlanta, uh, 
he was wanted just for abortion. And, and there's some folks who didn't say, okay, he's a cop killer. They said he bombed an abortion clinic. What could be bad about that? Yeah. How did he stay hidden so long? Ah, uh, the great mystery. He says it's a five and a half year camping trip. Uh, but if you look, if you, if you want to hold up the book cover again, yeah. you'll see this is a picture that's taken of Eric Rudolph. Uh, this is him literally a couple of hours after he's arrested. He didn't have time to take a shower then, so look how clean-shaven he is. He's got a day's growth of beard. He has, a, obviously, a haircut, mustache is trimmed. You know, he didn't smell. I mean, that's why he didn't smell like he had been camping. Yeah. And he had campsites. He gave up a couple of campsites. But there are all sorts of summer cabins up there, especially during the winter he could yeah. live there, mines and caves. But the big question is, who helped him? Uh, and he isn't talking. As part of his plea bargain, he didn't have to give any of that up. Well, what, uh, uh, when, he, when he was caught, how was he caught? Who caught him? Well, of all things, a rookie cop doing a routine business patrol behind a grocery store saw a man, looked like a prowler. In the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. Yeah. Tells him to stop. Guy stops. Turns out he has a backpack with, a, um, with a empty plastic bags. He was getting ready to go dumpster diving for food. Guy gave a false name, said his name was Jerry Wilson. That ID didn't check out. He didn't have any ID on him, obviously. Then when a backup arrived, one of the guys thought he recognized him as Eric Rudolph. They take him back to the Murphy Police Station. And uh, lo and behold, they, you know, there's plenty of wanted posters for him there. They run some stuff on the Internet. They do a quick fingerprint, and they've got Eric Rudolph. And after five years of intense uh, investigation, uh, it's, the capture is an accident. It is. You know, they had, the, the secret is, and I think he realizes, they had stopped looking for him after a couple years. Turns out that he was planning on, he had talked about um, that he was planning on, on sending off a bomb at their command post, and he claims that he, at the last minute, decided not to do it. And when he copped this plea, uh, he gave up the location of 250 pounds of dynamite and one bomb, and that bomb was about 50 yards away from where some of the people had been using a command post. He'd gotten that close. He'd gotten that close. He was, he was, uh, he was eyeballing them. He claims he'd gotten to the point where he was getting ready to set off the bomb. In fact, he says in this statement that he was going to take that bomb and set it off at an abortion clinic in Asheville, North Carolina, which is about an hour and a half away, during the 2000 presidential campaign. Mm. But he couldn't find a truck that would work. <laughs> well, what uh, punishment is he you're going to get? For life sentences without a chance of parole. He'll be in that supermax prison where Terry Nichols is and where Ramsey Youssef and some of the worst international terrorists and Ted Kaczynski. And in the Ted Kaczynski, who's the Unabomber connection is, they had the same lawyer, the same public defender who copped the same deal for both of them. Avoided the death penalty. Avoided the case. death penalty. Um, <clears throat> I've read some things uh, by uh, other writers as well mm -hmm. about this case since I knew mm -hmm. that I was going to have a chance to visit with you. And uh, one of them uh, uh, opined that uh, he thinks that, uh, uh, that Eric Rudolph thinks that he won. I think that Eric Rudolph thinks that he won, too. And you can get it from his own statement, because when the second line is, I cheated the government of, of the death penalty, he talks about how we'll go into the supermax prison. He's bloody yet unbowed. I think in his own mind, he thinks that he's going to walk out of there someday as a hero, be hailed as a hero. I think that's why he pitched this statement, this 11-page statement, to a the last two pages were an attack on me in the book, but he pitched it as abortion because even though he's been on the run for five and a half years, he spent the last two years watching TV, and I think he's trying to figure out what is the way that's going to make him seem the most palatable. And passing him, you know, admitting he's a white supremacist, admitting that he hates Jews and blacks, that's not going to fly. But if he can frame it in terms of abortion, then maybe, maybe he thinks in his own mind he's going to get some political sympathy. Well, it looks a little late for, for that. Yeah, let's hope so. I mean, yeah. uh, absolutely. Well, let me uh, ask you, uh, getting away from Eric Rudolph a little bit, you, your, your work and your study mm -hmm. goes well beyond this particular case, mm -hmm. and it goes to domestic and international terrorism. What do you see as the state of uh, uh, terrorism, uh, both domestically and internationally now? Well, internationally, I think we've got, you know, always be very worried. I think the U.S. government has been pretty successful in pushing the threat of international terrorism offshore. So it's like the old Cold War thing. They pushed it away from us, and that's good, though that leaves a lot of places, Europe, our troops in Iraq, very vulnerable. Uh, domestically, you know, we've focused so much in this country since 9-11, rightfully on what happened then and on the, the threat from Islamic terrorism, that we've ignored domestic terrorism. Uh, the Rudolph case, the 10th anniversary of the Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh bombing should be a reminder that even if we've forgotten about domestic terrorists, they haven't forgotten about us. Mm -hmm. I'll leave you this thought. The only person 
in this country since 9-11 who's actually been found to have weapons of mass destruction was a guy in Texas named William Carr who's now in a federal prison for possessing enough sodium cyanide to kill everybody in a 30,000 square foot building. Now, he's not Islamic. Um, he's not an Islamic fundamentalist. He's an American. He was a member of a militia. Uh, and he had those weapons. And we still got the anthrax killer out there. Henry, we have to interrupt. We're out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Wish you good luck on your speech at the uh, Institute. And uh, please come back to Oklahoma City anytime and let us know when you're coming. Thanks very much for We're having me. We're so pleased to have uh, uh, Henry Schuster, uh, the hunting for Eric Rudolph, Eric Rudolph author. Uh, he, I'll talk more about the book on the last segment. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back. Kent Myers finishing up this last segment of The Verdict. We are very pleased to have had Henry Schuster, the author of Hunting Eric Rudolph, with us today. I want to tell you that Henry's book is available at uh, Full Circle Bookstore in Oklahoma City, uh, is at Walden Books, uh, Barnes & Noble, and all the other major book outlets, as well as Amazon.com. Uh, a website that I might refer you to that you'll find more interesting information about uh, Henry and the book is www.huntingericrudolph.com. Uh, dot com. Also, uh, if you would do want to check our website, the, the www.theverdict.tv, let us hear from you. Let us know what you'd like to uh, see us do shows about, what's interesting to you, and we'll try to find the right guests to bring to you to give you good information. Uh, next week, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Marsha Moore, a Ph.D. psychologist and a school counselor at Cassidy School, talking about pressures uh, facing students, parents, and schools. Uh, for Mick Cornett, uh, I'm Kent Myers. Uh, thank you for joining us on The Verdict this Sunday morning. We'll see you next Sunday. Play for the best black and gold merchandise available.